Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Adam Heist. Kevin King, and Michael E. Gerber, the author of The E-Myth. Today, I'm speaking with Mike McCleary, the CEO of Amazing.com, the president of Zoof, and a seven-figure seller for the past 10 years. And we are going to be talking a lot about Amazon advertising and also diversifying your e-commerce business. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Mike, I started my business back in 2015 and grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years. However, I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path of getting to eight figures really take a lot longer than it needed to. There were a lot of times where I doubted my abilities as a leader, or I doubted my abilities to actually grow a household name brand that could survive, or even the managing cash flow issues within the business. If you've hit similar plateaus in your business and want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com, that's ecom with two M's, to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in your subject line say strategy audit. And then plead your case as to why I should choose you and your business to work with for this month's strategy session. But today I am super excited to introduce you all to Mike. Mike McCleary serves as a co-creator of Amazing.com's Amazing Selling Machine, aka ASM. ASM has helped thousands of entrepreneurs build profitable businesses selling products on Amazon. Mike has also sold millions of dollars of his own products on Amazon through multiple successful businesses. He loves helping as many people as possible build thriving e-commerce businesses through his tools and education. He's the father of two amazing kids and the teller of really, really bad dad jokes. So with that introduction, Mike, welcome to the show. And now I'm really interested in hearing your dad jokes. <laughs> You know, I knew you were going to put me in the spot with that once we <laughs> talked about that a little bit, because I can hear my kids groaning all the time when we tell these dad jokes. Um, well, my daughter was recently uh, just got approved to be an EMT in the state of Illinois, uh, actually got hired by her college, University of Illinois, to be an EMT. Her two roommates are EMTs as well, so all three of them. And so I suggested they start their own group called the three MTs. <laughs> they did not like that idea. Um, they didn't see the humor in it or at all, but you know, that was the best I could come up with on the spot because I just heard the groans last night when I told that to her. Hey, I, I love it, Mike. You've always got, you know, dad jokes that you've got to be a professional. Uh, if you're a dad, you've got to be a professional at the dad jokes. <laughs> it's, it's my just, goal. Got to keep embarrassing. You've got to be known for. I love it. Well, Mike, I think, uh, for our listeners who don't know about you, I would love for you to share just a brief background about yourself and how you came into the world of e-commerce, because you came from a different kind of uh, background where it was a more, you know, a corporate professional career that you came from. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about that journey and what led you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. So I uh, I definitely did not get into e-com until you know, for me, like 10 years ago, which seems like forever right now. Uh, and for some of your listeners, I'm sure that seems like a long time ago as well. But to me, that was, you know, I was well into my professional career. So grew up in a small town in Southern Illinois, uh, Belleville, Illinois, just outside of St. Louis, went to a state university. Uh, my first job out of college was working for a paint manufacturer, Benjamin Moore Paints, because that's where I I worked over the summers to put myself through school uh, and then realized that I didn't really want to be in sales. And that's what my job was. And so very quickly, I was able to get moved up to their corporate headquarters at the time in Chicago and started working in IT. Um, and so still a mid, you know, Midwest kind of guy doing a job more IT related back then. Uh, and I realized after a few years of doing IT for this paint company, uh, 
met my 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 soon to be wife there, by the way. So there's a, some big perks out of getting that job up there. I realized by getting into the support side of business, I was no longer on the revenue making side of business. So my income potential was really limited because, you know, start off in sales, moved out to support. And then the the sales manager there said, Mike, you're going to come back to sales. You're going to come back to sales at some point because people who don't who live on the cost side of the equation for a company do not get compensated enough. And that stuck with me for a long, long time. And there was so after you know doing that job for a couple of years, I actually decided that, you know, I got some good. IT related school, some finance schools actually had a, a finance degree at U of I where I went. Um, how can I combine those skills with being on the sales side of it? And so then, Josh, I actually got a job with Ernst & Young, uh, went to work as a consultant with them where I could use my technical finance skills, but sell myself for the company in order to uh, help generate revenue. It's kind of the, the best of both worlds at that time. The downside was I was traveling all the time. So I don't know about you, if you had, a, had to travel a lot in your career as well, yeah, fortunately not. I, I actually worked at American Airlines when I first started my career, right? Which you would think, you know, in the in the airline industry, I would be traveling a lot. Fortunately, all of my accounts that I was managing were all Dallas based. So traveling oh, by nice. car. But yeah, I, I know a lot of management consultants and I have heard their schedule and uh, you get paid well, but it also comes at a price, right? It, it definitely did. And so, you know, uh, next thing I know, we're my, my wife now, we're, we're engaged to get married, but I'm traveling all the time. And at that time, my first project was worth uh, Monsanto, now called Solution, I believe. But uh, we were switching up time between either New Orleans, fun, or Muscatine, Iowa, not so fun. Um, I apologize for anyone joining us from Muscatine, but it's commonly <laughs> known as the armpit of Iowa up there, unfortunately. Um, and it's, it's not a bad town, but they, at the time, and maybe it's not this way anymore at the time. And as Bush had a lot of their hops and grain refineries up there. So every morning when we drove in to the uh, Monsanto plant, there would be a yellow fog rolling over there, which if you've ever smelled the fermentation of hops, it's not a good smelling thing. It's this sweet pungent, more pungent than sweet smell. Uh, and so working up there was not ideal. And so I was the new guy at the company and all of us on the team were splitting time between Muscatine and New Orleans. You can imagine where they sent me more. It was <laughs> Muscatine, Iowa. Of course. So traveling all the time up there. Uh, now, I loved Ernst & Young. Uh, it was actually, you know, if I look back in my career of one of the jobs that I think gave me the most knowledge and business skills, that was definitely the start of it all because working with these huge companies, uh, Monsanto, Boeing, um, those are like two of the big clients, uh, Charter, uh, another client that I ended up working for later on full time, um, gave me all this experience to like really use my skills in, you know, technical skills, finance skills in order to help them generate more revenue. Uh, but the travel was like really taking a toll on me. And so within a couple of years, um, I actually started working as a consultant for Charter are now known as Spectrum in the St. Louis area with the, the reason being that I wouldn't have to travel. So still doing some, you know, consulting work for them out there, uh, but I wouldn't have to travel at all. And at that time I was able to become an independent consultant for them. So where, you know, big, big six at the time, consulting firms, they went down to big five. Now they're big four. I don't know what the number is today, uh, but they, they love going by going by those monikers. Uh, I was able to charge a much smaller hourly rate for me as a, as a young guy with, you know, a wife in the time, like soon to be another kid. It was a lot of money, even though for them it was a, it was a bargain. So it was a really good mix for us. Uh, however, after doing that corporate gig for a while, actually it was part of the revenue assurance department. Um, it was, again, had a great team, loved what I was doing. Uh, and the way that we kind of found made our, our special mark on the company was we would look for lost revenue. And so, again, I was part of this, I'd say support team, but I knew that I had to be a part of a team that generated revenue for a company. If you're ever going to make money, you have to be on the revenue generating side of it. And so our team would go out there and find areas where we were losing money. Uh, and the, the way that we kind of made our mark there was if you think of pay-per-view movies, that's how these companies make a lot of their money out there. And you would think that when you watch a movie on TV and you rent it, whether it's the UFC fight, or whatever it is, you push a button and it's so simple that everything just works smoothly. It shows up on your bill the next month. 
there's about 14 steps in between that. Between your remote and between that bill comes in the mail, there's all types of failure points. And I think at the time we're about 99% accurate on making sure that everyone got billed what they should be. Sounds great, 99%. That 1% was millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so our team went to work on filling those gaps. And that's how, you know, we became like a really sought after team inside the company. And I knew that, you know, I could have a really good career there, which eventually I did the same job, part of this team for 10 years, you know, part of the corporate structure. The last year they had finally said, Mike, you've been a consultant for us in this department for a decade. When are you going to come on board as a full-time employee? It's kind of like dating. I don't know. How long did you and your wife date, Josh, before you guys got married? Well, uh, she dated multiple people while she dated me. So it ended up being over the course of, what, 18 months or so. But okay, yeah, not 10 years, not 10 years. Okay, (laughs) so that's kind of how I felt with this company. I'd like been dating for 10 years every year when it comes budget time. We'd have the conversation. Is this the year become a full time employee or not? Um, Every year I was able to hold them off until 2012. Uh, and finally, they were making some moves. They're moving corporate headquarters around. I spent a lot of time in Denver. Awesome, awesome place out there. They're moving more to the uh, to the East Coast. And there was a chance that I might have to move or lose my job completely unless I came on as an employee. And so in 2012, I came on as an employee doing the exact same job. There was nothing, Josh, different at all about my job. Still the same team I worked with. Great people. I still talk to them today. Still did the same job. Plugged holes in the gap. We're still you know, always finding leaking revenue and, and making sure the company was good financially. But the moment that I became an employee, my entire mindset changed. Um, I just, I didn't feel like the same person, you know, the, again, no different job, no different. The pay was kind of the same. we made it all work out, but I just felt like I was now trapped into this corporate job. And I almost immediately started thinking, how can I get out of this? I can't go back to being a consultant. That's not going to work. And I was kind of a, I don't, it's kind of like, dating, marrying your wife, and then say, I want to go back to dating you again. It doesn't work that way. (laughs) I haven't tried it, but I'm assuming it doesn't work. Uh, I knew that wouldn't work for me. And so I started thinking about other ways that I could make money on the side. Uh, And I tried a couple things uh, over the years, but none of them worked out until I got an email uh, around January of 2013 uh, from the stupidest name possible of a program called the Amazing Selling Machine. And it seemed like spam and I almost didn't open it. Uh, One of my friends, Sherry, who actually works for me now, forwarded it to me. And she says, this looks legit. You might want to try it out. And against my better, against my own judgment, I thought was good at the time. I opened it and I started watching this business model that at the time had not become very popular, basically private label. Um, And these two guys, Matt and Jason, had a video about how you could build your own private label business. And once I saw the first video on what's possible, It did open my eyes to what is possible building your own brand and selling them on Amazon. Um, I had no idea this was a possibility. I thought that every product I bought in the world, that company was a manufacturer, whether it was Rayovac making batteries or Duracell making batteries or Kleenex making tissues. I thought they had plants all over the world. They own these plants and they're making these products. And then I realized there, I kind of felt like an idiot. Most of these companies don't own the manufacturing plants. They're outsourcing that part of their business. They may have long term contracts with them, but they're hiring the best plants who do this for a living to make their products for them. And that we could do it, too, just like you do now, Josh, and so many people. You can hire these manufacturers to make products for you and sell it under your brand name. In essence, you become the manufacturer in the eyes of companies like Amazon and and your customers. And once I realized that simple concept, a switch was just flipped for me that this is something that I would love doing and so many people could love doing as well. Uh, So I joined up, didn't tell my wife Um, at the time. It was, you know, several thousand dollars. I ended up telling her a month later, right before the refund date, uh, because I wanted to make sure that, okay, I did this. I think it'll work. I can get a refund right now if you want me to. What do you think? And she was awesome. She's like, Heck no. I haven't seen you happier in the past 30 days. Now I know why. Um, Keep doing it. Uh, And so I, you know, it stuck with it within 
60 days or so, we had already ordered our products. Our brand was launched by the end of May of that year. Uh, I think May 30th was the day that our product got launched on Amazon. June 1st was the day we made it for sale. Uh, my brother was working with me at the time. We kind of went on this together. He was more creative than I was. So he would do the, the graphics design and things like that. Uh, and then products just took off like gangbusters. I actually shared my first product at our recent SellerCon. It was a leather conditioner called Leather Afterlife. Um, and it, you know, it, it did really well low ticket product and I loved selling it, but it wasn't, <laughs> I didn't think at the time it could turn into a big money maker for us. Uh, and then I go see other people out there crushing it with these consumer products, whole nother podcast, whole nother story. Uh, so we quickly got into the led camping and lighting space, uh, and then launched the brands of lanterns, flashlights. And within a year I was at a point where I could quit my corporate job that I now had, uh, and do this full time. Uh, and it was n I'd never been more happier in my life other than, you know, married, getting married and having kids. That moment when I realized I am now making enough to quit this job that I don't want to do uh, and do full time what I really have not have a new passion for. And so I told my boss that January, I believe that I was going to quit. Gave him plenty of notice that I could transition someone into my role uh, and then ended up retiring or resigning from that job a few months later, all within a year of launching my first product. And I've never looked back. I've looked forward and done lots of other things, as you mentioned when you're reading it off. Uh, but it has been a life changing event for me. Yeah, that gets that me to here. Hopefully that was brief enough for my little history there. No, that's that's amazing. Well, I, I love that uh, you're. You can preach uh, because you actually went through the course, right? You actually started something. And I think all I think everybody has the stigma of guru, Amazon gurus, right? That are like flashing these, you know, nice cars and whatever. Right. And it's like, but they've never actually made money on Amazon. Right. <laughs> um, and so I think that that like speaks volume to like you actually went through it. Right. You didn't come out initially as like a guru trying to tell people how to, you know, sell online. It's like, no, you went through the process. You've been there, done that, and you're actively doing it, which I think makes all the difference. So, Mike, I am curious, though, to hear, you know, you've got 10 plus years of selling on Amazon. You've seen Amazon change drastically over those 10 years. And I feel like the amount of change coming on Amazon is only getting faster and quicker. and it's hard to keep up with everything. So, Mike, I'm interested to hear of all the things Amazon's currently changing and working on right now. What are some of the things that come to the top of your mind that you're you're actively working on? Yeah, so I think the biggest change that I've seen is that when I started selling, there was no such thing as advertising on Amazon. It, there was no PPC. When they came out with it, it was a little scary. Like, I got to pay for advertising. I haven't had to pay for advertising the previous year. You know, you just throw a product up there, you know, you know, rub your hands together like Mr. Miyagi and it starts selling as long as you did the things the right way. And now there's this new feature called Amazon sponsored products. And I believe at the time it was just auto. I don't think you had even any control at the time, but it was like, do you want to give us money or not? Those are the two <laughs> options at the time. Uh, and so that was, it was an interesting feature to try out and we did it and it worked great because no one else was advertising. It was cheap. I remember the days of, you know, 10 cent clicks uh, on Amazon. And of course, you know, once Amazon started doing that and who knows, they're, they're really smart over there. They probably, you know, foresaw that this would become a huge money maker for them. I think anyone who's on Amazon would say pretty much advertising and Amazon advertising has been the biggest change over the past decade. Um, at first, I would say it's the biggest positive change for sellers. And then I'd say over the past couple of years, I'm not gonna say it's negative, but I'm thinking that it's made things more challenging because it now is a pay to play system. If you don't advertise, um, it's incredibly difficult to actually make sales. I'm not saying impossible, but it's very difficult to compete with the big companies out there. And so I think that's like the biggest change on the positive side, though, um, including Amazon's advertising system, they have really upped their game over the past couple of years on the different tools and features they're giving us. Uh, the different ways you can advertise now, the different reports you can see. I believe it was just in the past, you know, six months or so, they released the uh, reporting by product, which is something I've always wanted to see. You've always had to use an external tool, but I want to know for this particular lantern, I got 20, 50 campaigns running. 
how is it doing? I don't want to go in there, pull down all the reports and look at it. You can very quickly see that now. That was a really great like dashboard feature. The ability to go out there and create, uh, you know, display ads now and really do much better at targeting. They were horrible at first. I believe the first time that I spoke at a live event and I talked about Amazon PPC and they had just released display advertising, I gave a presentation on it. And my presentation was one slide. Don't do it because <laughs> I lost my butt on it the first time it came out. Like I, I love trying on the new features and I can feel like that's in my role. That's something that I need to do. I need to always try these new features out, even to my own detriment. Uh, and I remember trying it and it was terrible. Um, either I'm incredibly dumb, which, you know, it's always up on the table as a possibility or it just wasn't there yet. Uh, and at the time, it really was not there as a good channel. There was so little controls. You were pretty much at Amazon's whim. Now it's it's a much better way. If you really know the way that these funnels work, when you start at the top and work your way down, there's a place for all the different types of advertising that Amazon gives us. Uh, and they give us so many other tools as well, Josh. I mean, you've seen everything inside of brand registry. That menu keeps getting bigger uh, yeah. as the more and more features on there. I don't know if you've tried it yet. Like I know a lot of people talking about the it's brand something. I can't think of the second name to it. You can send emails to customers. Yeah, tailored. Brand, brand tailored promotions, right? Yeah. What a great, amazing feature they've released. And I have not heard a lot of people talking about it. Like we have the ability now to do abandoned cart emails, to send emails to our most, our best, highest spending customers, to reach customers we think would be good for us. Actual emails uh, and give them a coupon as well in order to incentivize them. I saw it. I tested it out. I saw this weird looking coupon on my own listing the other week. I'm like, I didn't create that. Where's that at? And it's part of brand tailored promotions. They look different. And yep. only if you're one of the people they've targeted, will see it because everyone else that I asked to look at my listing didn't see it. And they thought I was crazy. They're right. But not because of that is because I use that new feature on there. And I think there's many, many more features. I'm sure there is that Amazon will be releasing to us. So for me, the way the different tools they give you to promote your business with inside inside the platform is probably the biggest change that I've seen over the past couple of years on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. I think that Amazon is definitely leaning more into brands. Right. And they want brands to actually like adopt their platform and, and be kind of their main platform to get your products out to customers. Right. And I think that your perspective is going to be really unique as we dive into this too, because I know that one thing that you and Matt are working on right now is like, how do you diversify off of Amazon? Right. And do you put all of your eggs in the Amazon basket? What are some of the pros and cons? But before we get to the whole diversification conversation, Mike, I'm interested to hear your perspective of what do you feel like Amazon sellers specifically right now should be focused on if they want to grow or scale their business from, you know, maybe seven figures now to eight figures and beyond? So um, I think it depends on if you just want to focus on Amazon or you want to branch out and diversify. And I have to preface this by saying, I think anyone who's at that point, there are seven figures, you need to be thinking about diversification right now, not before it's too late, because you're you're always at the whim of someone else's platform. Um, and I wouldn't want any business of mine to be at the whim of anyone else's platform right now. So I would immediately start having a plan for diversification. Uh, but on Amazon, I would really lean into a couple things here. One would be building your brand like you talked about, Josh. They're giving us these tools for a reason. And most of the times those tools are only available to brand owners because they want the brand approach. They don't want people going out there. I don't believe they want people out there just gaming the algorithm. Uh, that's been happening too long now. And every time that someone does that, they try to switch it up so you can't game it. But if you have a really strong brand with great products, great service and great pricing, that's who they want. So give them who they want and what they want. And I think Amazon will continue to reward you. Great products, great brand, great pricing, still make a profit. You have to profit. Otherwise, there's no point in being in business uh, and great customer service. You do those things. And I think the risk of your business not doing well, uh, lower a lot. Uh, and then I think that Amazon will continue rewarding you as well. You may never own the customer because that's their customer, but I think you have a pretty good chance of being successful on Amazon and growing uh, to the levels you're talking about, even if it's just on Amazon. Yeah. So your recommendation is just to kind of lean into all of the I guess the new features that Amazon is providing brand owners, the brand tailored promotions premium A plus content, right? 
anything else that you've seen as like, a, I guess, a good tool that you've been able to implement because you are a brand owner? Uh, experiments. Um, there's a reason they want us to experiment because they can't continue to experiment with all of our products, but they're giving us the ability to. Uh, I recommend experimenting every week. Um, you know, once you find a winner, let that winner be, you know, your new title, your new image, bullets, A plus content description. But once you do that, find another one to test. You should always be testing. Uh, I just had a conversation with some other folks that I, I think the the future of AI is going to be continual testing and improvement. And I think AI will allow us to do that. I would imagine Amazon's probably got their eye on that, as a matter of fact, so that you can continually test new images, products, descriptions, bullets, titles, A plus and continually optimize. Uh, but I don't think it ever ends. I think yeah. optimization using Amazon's experiments is a continual process, not something you do once every year or once and you're done. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective because yeah, it's, it's never just set it and forget it. In fact, if you set it and forget it on Amazon, it's six months from now, you're going to start just declining, right? Because there, it is an active management of, uh, of a business really. And I, I always laugh at the people that uh, preach this make passive income on Amazon, Amazon business owners know that it is far from passive, right? And I think that they also, you know, I think it's a good mindset shift though in general, that if you are a business owner, you want to scale to that eight figures and beyond. You have to actively be doing something with your business every single day, whether it's testing a different image or price or bullets. Um, Mike, I'm curious, like from the tests that you've run, have you seen one of those, you know, variables be more influential than others, whether it be the title, image, pricing, what do you, what do you see from your side? Yeah, uh, the, the biggest for testing is by far the image, because that's going to get their attention. And if you don't get their attention, then nothing else down the funnel matters. So testing the image is what you really want to do. Um, uh, the next would be not so much the title, like the title. It's, it's, it's interesting because for me, the title is a combination of traffic and conversion. Uh, you have to have the right features in the title to get the traffic. But if it doesn't convert, then it's not going to work. So that's really an art. Uh, but it, what's more important to me is pricing. Uh, and what I talked a little bit about at Celicon is being able to get the constant strike through pricing. Now, I don't like the game systems like that's not a long term business strategy to me, but it seems to me that 90 percent of the top selling products all have strike through pricing, which, you know, is like you have a standard price, which is your list price or MSRP price. And then it's now your discounted price. When you see that, when a customer sees that, they immediately believe they're getting a good value and they're getting a discount off of it. And if you're comparing two products, it doesn't really matter what the price is, but if I'm looking for two different products and I see one of them has a huge discount right now, I'm more prone to go for that product because I think I'm getting a much better value. So I have seen pricing be the biggest determining factor other than the image when it comes to optimization. And I immediately know when I lose my, my strike through pricing, I can go check my ads and they're performing like crap because I've lost it. Uh, my conversion is going down. People are just clicking and, mar and going away. Uh, and so you need to constantly be trying to get that really good strike through pricing, whether it's uh, just a sales price, whether it's a prime exclusive discount, whether it's a deal you can run like the best deals. They switched over seven day deals, the best deals now, um, or it's just a normal, um, I don't know, a coupon you're using on there, which isn't the same, but it also helps you get the pricing uh, discounts to customers that you really need to have. You have to be a good value on Amazon right now. Um, otherwise, I think that you're really missing out on sales that other products are getting. Yeah. Yeah. And Mike, I was there at your SellerCon presentation. And one of the things that was, I guess, mind opening for myself was you talked about the conversion bomb. And I have loved that since the day I heard it. We've implemented it in our business. We've actually been able to see kind of the average number of units per order go up because we're incentivizing people to buy multiple units now. So, Mike, I would love for you to share, you know, I think this is one of the quickest wins. If people are not doing this today, it's going to increase your conversion rate. It can also influence and also help boost up your number of units sold per transaction, which is more profit as well. And then uh, overall, like it's a, this flywheel, it's going to help your ranking at the same time. So exactly. Mike, <laughs> drop the conversion bomb. Not All right. Bomb. I, I love that name, by the way, not because I came up with it, because I came up with it just like out of the blue, because Matt Clark, my business partner, 
always tells me I have to come up with a cool name. You can't just tell them you're going to tell them how to really get a good optimized listing. It has to be a cool name. I'm like, well, what about the conversion bomb? He's like, I love it. And I was joking, um, <laughs> but it's stuck. I'm able to create really good mid journey images for a conversion bomb. So uh, the conversion bomb is all about increasing sales and conversions. And it all starts with the strike through pricing like we just talked about. When I analyzed the top sellers from almost any category I looked at, all med strike through pricing. So the first step is to tweak Amazon's, uh, I guess, their, their brain that goes out there and looks at pricing to make it realize or think that you're giving a discount at all times. And so you need to be selling at a higher price, your list price. And the way to get that to work is to sell at your list price, but have either a coupon on there because the coupons do not factor into that. You could have a 50% off coupon and Amazon still sees that as a full price sale, what your higher price is. You do that for a couple of days. You can also do it with a prime exclusive discount as well, because prime exclusive discounts only give people a discount who are prime. So it means your other customers are not prime. They're also selling at that higher, let's call it the list price. Once you get a few days of sales and it may need to be a little longer. If you've been selling for years, it may need to be a week or two, but you have to set that reference price. So what Amazon calls it, then you lower the price via prime exclusive discounts again or a sales price and you will get the slash through pricing. Uh, and that usually sticks between 30 and 90 days because that's how their algorithm looks at. It looks at what's the prevailing price uh, of the reference price over the past 90 days. I've seen it lower to 30, but they say 90. Once you lose that, you repeat the process. Go out there, raise your price, offer a coupon or a prime exclusive discount, set, reset your reference price. And then a few days later, have that sale price or prime exclusive discount again to continue getting the slash of pricing. That's the first part. Then the second part is to add as many converting badges on your listing as possible. The first one is going to be a coupon. We all know how to create these. Just create a simple coupon. It can be as little as 5% off. But you need the coupon because the coupons show up in the search results. People will see that pretty little green save 5%, $5, $1, whatever it is. You create the coupon on there. Then you can create more badges that show right up at the very top. So they don't have to scroll down. Uh, back in the day, Josh, when you and I were selling several years ago, if you created what's a promotion, which is different from a coupon, no one saw those. They had to scroll down to the bottom of the page. They might see special promotions offered by this seller. Now they're actually putting them right up at the top. So the next promotion I would create would be a money off promotion uh, on two products. So if they order two products, I'll give them 10% off. And most of us selling the space, if someone buys two products, you got enough margin to offer them 10% off. If you don't, raise your prices or lower your costs, one of the two. Uh, but because people will see then at this point, then they're going to have that slash the pricing we created. They're going to see the coupon you put out there. And then below that is going to be another badge that's going to say save 10% on two products. And then you can create another promotion. And what I do is give them 15% off for three products. And it's super simple. You can create these right inside of the standard Amazon promotions advertising part of the, of the menu. Uh, and then you have those four different conversion factors, slash the pricing, the regular coupon, the discount at two for two products or more, and the discount for three products or more. Now, these do stack together. So be aware of that, that they will all add up. However, you're able to set the discounts on both a coupon and on promotions to only be for one unit. Uh, you, there's a checkbox to check in there. So if they buy a lot more, they're not going to continue getting every discount for everyone they buy. So be sure to set that in there. Uh, however, I'll tell you what I did this morning uh, when we when I was getting up, I analyzed lots of stuff here. I knew we were gonna talking about this. I pulled down the last couple of weeks sales for one of our products where we have a five dollar coupon on there and I have the conversion bomb enabled. Less than half the people were taking advantage of the coupon and everything else. So. It, it's crazy. Like the coupon everyone should get. I, I hope people who just buy on Amazon aren't seeing this because then they're going to remember to always click that coupon box. But most people don't realize, most shoppers don't realize that in order to get that coupon, they have to check that box. Less than half are using that right now. Now, if you order, if you give them 50% off on just a coupon, that number goes up probably closer to like 80%. But I have a, I have a $5 coupon. It's about 5% right now, testing it out. Less than half are using it. And even less than that, went ahead and ordered two or three. Uh, but with those numbers, just count on if only half the people use that coupon, you're only really giving that big of a discount to them to half the or 
half of that amount goes to all of them or the full amount to half of them. However you want to look at the math there. So you're really not giving up as much of a margin as you think. And you should always have enough margin to make these things work for you. Otherwise, you know, you, like I said, you need to look at your numbers. But the beauty is, even if I account for everyone using every single one of those discounts on my product, let's say I make that a break even scenario. I'm OK with that. Because I've just sold a lot of units. I've got another customer that's going to increase my BSR, lower my BSR, whatever you're looking at, increase my sales. And then the flywheel you talked about, Josh, just keeps spinning where I get more and more sales. Because the more you sell, the more Amazon's going to promote you as well. Yeah. That is the conversion bomb. Mike, I love that conversion bomb. I love it. <laughs> um, I think the other thing to add on to this, um, because we, we have a SKU catalog of over 1,300 SKUs, right? Mm -hmm. So it's no uh, small feat to actually roll this out across all of our SKUs. And we have different like product categories. One of the things that I've loved about adding these extra promotions where it's, hey, save 10% off if you buy two or more or get 15% off if you buy three or more. The nice part is Amazon actually gives you a dedicated landing page for those products to shop at, right? So if people are like, oh, what two products? It's not Let's say it's a product that you're like, people only need one of these. Like if they are getting two of these, they genuinely like they don't use it, which is a lot of our products. They don't need multiple of the same product. Right. What it ha what happens, though, is it will show you like applicable products right on Amazon and people can click that URL and then it will load a whole landing page that's just going to be your products only. And these are the only products that are applicable for that promotion. So in my case, I don't throw all 1300 ASINs onto that page because it would just go on forever and then people would just get lost and peace but you out. Could. Right? But I you mean, could, but yeah. you could, you could. For those who have large catalogs, if you want to make this simple, you don't have 1300 like, yep. like Josh does, you can select your entire catalog if you want to. Uh, yeah. But you're more thoughtful than that. We've been a little more thoughtful and I think it's led to better results because mm -hmm. what happens is we're going to share you know maybe it's a calendar right and then it's going to be a matching meal planner right and like people are like oh i didn't even think about this right and so then it's also starting to influence that frequently purchased together section right and so rather than just saying hey do you also want uh, some appointment cards for your dentist office or something like that it's like I don't even have a dentist office or whatever it is, right? Instead of seeing those products, we've been more methodical and saying, hey, with these products, offer these promotions. And we've seen really good success that way. So oh, yeah. I wanted to yeah. just cross-selling, upselling. That's fantastic. I love hearing that. Love it. All right, Mike, I want to steer our conversation back to advertising, which you said was one of the biggest changes that has happened over the last decade on Amazon. And Amazon's changing advertising at a very quick pace right now. Um, they're partnering with a lot of off-site, um, I guess, sites <laughs> right now, right? You've got Pinterest, you've got BuzzFeed, and Amazon is going to start showing your ads there. Um, maybe a little concerning. I guess my question to you, Mike, is what should a seven-figure seller that wants to continue to scale their business be focused on in regards to Amazon advertising right now, because it is certainly paid to play. Things are only getting more expensive. People believe that it's part of the ranking algorithm at the same time. So where should people be spending their time and money on Amazon advertising? You know, and, and, and I know that sometimes I've said things that, you know, you shouldn't focus on ranking anymore. Um, forget about that. Forget about the, you know, the honeymoon period. Uh, I say that like I, I do believe it in general. But it doesn't mean that you should always ignore those things. Uh, I do believe there's a time and place for those. I think that if you're a brand that has a strategy and you have a very good plan for, I have the money to launch this new product, spend a lot of money on advertising, and I'm fairly confident that I can get this product ranking, then I think that's the thing to do. You can use Amazon still and their advertising to rank products. It still works today. You just have to be able to accept the risk. And the risk is a financial risk. So if you have the funds to do that uh, and a good plan, a strategy, you believe you can do it. You're just not going out there and haphazardly bidding on low converting search terms, then that strategy can absolutely still work. So I don't want to discount that for people. However, if you have limited funds and you don't really have the 
a lot of confidence that just by throwing a bunch of money at advertising, you can rank that product. I would be very cautious to do that. Um, again, you still can be have some people help you out who know how to do that, but just be cautious because I haven't seen as many ranking successes from new products as we used to in the past. In the past seven to 10 days, focus on, you have a big coupon on your product, focus on some long tail keywords, and then slowly start going towards more aggressive. That was the play. Um, that still can work. I just don't see as many successes because if you think about it, everyone else is doing that right now. You have lots of sellers, uh, particularly maybe manufacturers overseas who can beat you on price every day. And so they're going to do more volume than you. And if someone above you is doing more volume for the exact same search term, you're not going to be able to move ahead of them no matter how much money you throw at it, uh, which is why I just caution people. It still works, but you have to have the financial resources and a plan to do it and the resources that if it doesn't work, you're OK. I don't want to see anyone go out there and blow 10, 20 grand on a launch and products um, and then that devastate their life. That's not not the play that I would suggest anyone doing. If you're a seven figure seller, chances are you know what you're doing um, and you probably have some resources to do this. You probably have some good experience creating a well converting product page. I think you can still use Amazon to ramp up ranking, but I would just be more methodical. I would really try to go out there and try to focus on the search terms that you believe are the best for you, the best converting. You don't want to just go after the most popular search terms. I know this is pretty common for anyone who's done stuff on Amazon, but really focus on the ones that you believe you can rank for and can convert well for and look at the numbers. Look at where you're converting in brand analytics compared to everyone else. If your product isn't as good or isn't priced as well as your competitors, you're not going to be able to beat them out. And so I would not waste money doing that. I would really try to optimize your ads. So um, I, I, I'm tired of giving Amazon all my money for advertising. I still give it to them. I'm just tired of giving it all to them. And so I'm really focusing now on profitability and growing smart. So I do know that there's margins I, I want to get out there and there's that price elasticity. And if I can only go down so low and I know that I'm not going to compete against anyone else who's going down lower than where I'm willing to go, I'm not going to go any lower and I'm not going to give up margin and and profits just to try to outrank them because eventually I have to raise my price up to where I need to be in order to make a profit. And why waste all that time ranking at this low price, spending all this money, if eventually and pretty quickly you're going to lose that ranking. So I know my profit margins. I know my price range I'm willing to sell in. I stick to that. I go out there and focus on profitable sales and PPC. And I pretend, pretend that every sale is going to come from an advertising click. It's mm -hmm. not the case. You'll start ranking. Everyone's ranking. Amazon's promoting you. You don't even realize it. They're sending out emails. They're showing you on other sites without you paying for it. Uh, but if I pretend that every sale comes from a click on advertising, then I have a pretty good idea of where I need to hit and what I can afford to spend. Uh, and then all the other sales are just gravy. Um, and, and, you know, a good strategy, I think, Josh, is make your advertising break even, whatever you're spending on it, at least break even. And then all the other organic sales are your profit. It's yeah. not terribly easy to plan that way, but I think that's a good strategy to use. Yeah. Mike, I think that's that's an important mindset shift for people to have, especially as Amazon advertising gets more and more expensive as they start opening up these bigger kind of more display advertising where you're showing up on BuzzFeed and Pinterest. And that's a very high level funnel, right? That's like putting up a billboard. And if you're just starting your business, you don't need a billboard. Let's just say that, right? You don't need to just create brand awareness. Um, and so I would argue, I think the approach that you talked about where focusing on the profitability, assume every single one of your sales is going to come from Amazon advertising. Can you still be profitable or in your opinion, at least break even from all of those sales on Amazon ads? If that's the case, then you can continue playing in that game. If not, then you've got to optimize those campaigns back to where they're going to be profitable. And I think this is important because if people kind of turn a blind eye and they just think about, well, I heard somebody else has 20% tacos and they consider that good. Somebody else had 5% tacos. It's like, it doesn't matter. You got to stop comparing yourself to other people. Like you need to focus on your own brand. You don't know their profit margins. You don't know what other ranking stuff or other external ads that they have going on. And so I think the first and foremost, like sellers need to get very clear on their numbers and then make sure that those ads are optimized to turn a profit. Um, because yeah, I think that 
The game is just continuing to evolve on Amazon advertising. And if you turn a blind eye to it, I'm sorry, but you're going to get left behind and it's it's not going to be very pretty a couple of years from now. Like I couldn't agree more the way that I've never shared this analogy publicly, but here's the way I look at it. Uh, advertising on Amazon is like playing blackjack with idiots because you don't have full control. You could be the smartest person on earth. You can count cards. But if there's an idiot at either corner and they're making decisions that are going to totally mess you up, it's out of your control. And there are a lot of people playing an advertising game on Amazon that don't care about you. I mean, it's not that they should. They're just they're just trying to throw money and get sales. And so if they're willing to spend a lot more and sell the products for a lot less, you can have the best strategy on earth and you're at the whim of everyone else out there. So like I said, pay attention to it. Keep you got to keep every week. I look at mine multiple times throughout a week. Look at your ads, optimize, see what's working, see what's not working. It's never done. It's a constant process. Yeah, I think the other thing just to double down on that real quick is that COVID was a good thing and a bad thing for Amazon. Yes, there was a lot of Amazon Prime adoption that happened, right? That's a good thing. On the downside, a lot of those big corporations were like, holy crap, all of the sales are now happening on Amazon and not in retail stores. We need to be on Amazon. And so with that, that's where you've kind of got, if you want to call them idiots playing blackjack with you, you've got these guys that somebody... I don't know, at Hallmark or whatever, has hired some MBA that has no idea what Amazon, how to run the Amazon advertising program, but they hire them and then they just tell them to go for it, right? They're like, as long as you're just making money, we don't even care if it's profitable because we've got all these other channels, right? And I think that's the thing that private label sellers, where Amazon is their main and only channel, like they need to be very careful because if they're getting $5 CPCs you're not going to outbid some of those, you know, corporations that have very deep pockets. And in fact, they're probably losing money on Amazon, but they frankly don't care. 100%. It's a great way to look at it. So, Mike, last thing before we start wrapping up here, you talked about diversification. Um, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Like, when is the right time for people to consider moving off of Amazon? Right. Or at least not off of Amazon completely, but like starting to launch more of their products on other channels and which channels should people be focused on? Is it Walmart? Is it TikTok shop? Is it Shopify? Uh, give me kind of a breakdown of what you've seen working for existing sellers. So I think the right time is right now. And even before you start selling, I would consider launching on another platform even before you launch on Amazon. And here's the reason why uh, we, and this is from experience, not just theory. Uh, we've seen brands and new sellers who, when they've started selling on Shopify and started running ads, let's face it. Like if you're selling on your own website, you're going to run Facebook ads. That's kind of the, that's the game right now. And it works. It works pretty well. Facebook does have a way over time, give them enough data. They'll find your customers. Uh, so if you do that, you start off on Facebook and um, on Shopify and using ads from Facebook, I would then very quickly then launch on Amazon. You can do both at the same time if you want to, but I actually like starting on Shopify first because what will happen, Josh, is that people who see your ads, go to your website, they're going to go to Amazon and look for your product. And so what we do is we start launching brand ads right away on Amazon and those perform like gangbusters. So if you imagine people are people all the time want to shop around. They're going to see your ads. They're going to go to your website. They're going to want to know if they can get a better deal on Amazon. They're going to go to Amazon. And this is where the game has changed. Before, when you launched on Amazon, there's no reason to do brand advertising because no one knows who your brand is. You don't need that billboard yet. But if you're already spending money on ads and sending people to your own brand website, people will start searching for your brand on Amazon. And that is an easy way to scoop up additional sales. Uh, and that's what I would do. I would like launch on your own website very quickly within a matter of days or at the same time, just all a matter of your time you have put into it. Also launch on Amazon so that you're going to scoop up those extra sales. It'll make your launch on Shopify easier because that advertising spend going to your website is going to be driving additional sales on Amazon. That'll help offset the cost of advertising. Hard to track, uh, but you can see brand advertising campaigns on Amazon and guaranteed those are coming from people looking at your other ads. So I would very quickly Shopify right on Amazon. That's the order I would recommend anyone go to with my, my son, my friend's family. Um, and then I would also, after a month or two, launch on Walmart. 
uh, because you do need a little bit of history. You don't need years or even months. They want to make sure that they're only bringing on legitimate brands who are already selling other platforms. So within a month or so, I would then launch on Walmart. It's another easy platform right now. Not very scalable, but I got a lot of faith in Walmart. When they do something, they may be slow, but they do ramp things up and they invest in it. And we've worked with Walmart over the past year and a half uh, to understand their platform so we can teach people how to use it. And they are building in more and more features. If you go to their advertising, you'll see it's looking more and more like Amazon every time they release new features. Uh, and so it's easy sales right now on Walmart. I would not launch on Walmart because there's not enough traffic right now in volume to get that going. But if I'm already paying for ads on my own website, um, I'd launch on Amazon and launch on Walmart because the same thing's going to happen there. People will go to Walmart and start looking for your brand as well. Those are the three platforms that I would launch on almost simultaneously, simultaneously but I would start off on my own website because I think at the end of the day, you're going to own those customers. That's going to be really valuable for you. Um, if you realize that your products are taking off on Amazon and your sales or your ads on your own website just aren't profitable, it's not easy to do. You have to come up with different angles, test those angles. It's not simple to do. Um, then go all in on Amazon. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah. I would never say that you have to sell on your own website and forget about Amazon. If you realize after you've launched on those both those platforms that Amazon is working better for you or making profit, that's when you switch those funds over to there. But at that point, you have, you know, you have multiple channels going already. You can take the profits you're then making on Amazon if that's working for you and then test out new angles. And selling on your website is all about the angles and the hooks. And mm. once you get it right, then it's just about scaling. But getting it right means it takes some time to get there. Um, and so that's the process I would do. And then the wild card, you mentioned it, is TikTok shop. Like we're not on there yet. But the next time that I'm on a podcast, I want to give you results because I plan on getting onto TikTok shop because I believe that for the first time ever, we have a competitor for Amazon. We may say or think it's Walmart, uh, but Walmart's a different game, different clientele. They're slower to the game. They'll get there eventually. TikTok is kind of like Amazon. They got lots of money, lots of cash. Uh, they're very big into the newer, younger audience. They want to go out there and become another place to shop. And I think their investments are going to mean it's going to be like Amazon 10 years ago for us. It'll, it'll be easy to sell uh, for the first couple of years because not a lot of people will be out there. They'll be in incentives to make it happen. Um, they'll, they're going to like help get everything going for you. Being very open to sellers, helping sellers uh, where, you know, Amazon's not really that way or they weren't that way in the beginning either. But TikTok, I think is going to be the next big thing in sales. It could fall flat on its face. The biggest risk factor is going to be if they get shut down and you can't sell there. So I wouldn't go all in and say, I'm only going to sell there. Uh, but I do think that if I were selling now, once I'm up on my website, Amazon and Walmart, I would very quickly get up on selling on TikTok to be one of the early adopters because it may not work. All you lose a little bit of time, maybe a tiny bit of money. But if it works, I have a funny feeling we're going to start seeing some really big success stories uh, because it'll, things will just go viral over there where they don't have that ability to go viral in other places. Yeah, Mike, I love that breakdown. I think that's a very like pragmatic approach to all of this. And, you know, with TikTok shop, you you. I love the nickname you gave it. it truly is a wild card. Like we have no idea this. It could either be wildly successful, could fall flat on its face. But the one thing that TikTok has going for it, it's got all the eyeballs right now. Everybody. Exactly. Right. And that's one thing that Amazon's known for quick delivery speeds and stuff right now. Right. And so anyways, we could go into this whole conversation of, uh, you know, what, what, what we believe TikTok needs to have in order to actually compete with Amazon. but. It is true. That's where a lot of eyeballs are. Um, I want to add one extra kind of like, I guess, food for thought for you here, Mike. Um, and for our audience, most importantly, you know, when we first started on Amazon, we we saw a lot of success, right? We did seven figures our first full year on Amazon. Um, but then, you know, we had heard so many times like diversify, 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 because you never know if Amazon's going to suspend you. You're going to wake up one morning and it's all going to be down. Right. And so we started trying to go on to Shopify and initially it didn't work very well for us. And then we're, we said, well, now we need to create a blog in order to drive traffic to this, um, you know, Shopify store. And then if we have a blog, we need to have these videos and tutorials in this YouTube channel, right? So all of a sudden we started racking up these kind of like six figure salaries across the board to support this channel. 
that actually wasn't really producing much revenue at all, right? But Amazon still continued to churn out um, good revenue for us, right? So Amazon was kind of feeding this, call it a passion project or diversification project, but it never really lived up to its full potential. Um, COVID hit us right in the middle of the face. And then we said, all right, screw the extra channels right now. Let's make sure we fully maximize everything we can out of Amazon and then start putting our attention to these additional channels. And so the one lesson that I think I've learned is that if you are going to experiment with these other channels, there is a lot of power in partnering with whether it be an agency or other people. If you have deep pockets and you want to pay somebody six plus figures that knows how to run and drive traffic to um, Shopify storefronts, then go do that, right? Goes back to the book, who, not how. My biggest recommendation would be this. Keep focusing on Amazon if you're having a lot of success on Amazon. Keep launching new products and keep, keep your eye on the ball there. But don't take your eye off the ball to think that you need to go figure out Shopify by yourself or that you need to go figure out Walmart or even TikTok by yourself. Make sure you're bringing in experts. And I think you'll have a better, I guess, outcome overall. I mean, Mike, any thoughts that you would have on that in terms of like entrepreneurs only have a limited amount of time. Do you double down or do you need to diversify? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that if you're going to diversify, which I, I still think everyone should diversify, even if it's not going all in. Uh, I think just having, you know, being everywhere all the time makes sense. Kind of like the movie came out. What is it? You know, everywhere. Oh, I don't even. I can't even think of the name. Everywhere all the time. Whatever it is, the 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 the, the kung fu movie. We'll call it. Yeah, that. yeah. Um, that came out right when we were getting into Shopify, and I think there's a lot of value in being everywhere because your customers will see you. They'll look for you everywhere. Having that brand gives you more legitimacy. Um, so I think you do diversify, but do you have to like say that this? Next three months, I am going to put every effort towards a Shopify site or Walmart. No, it, especially if you aren't confident that it's going to work for you. Um, I wouldn't do that. If you have people that you can turn to to help you, and this is not a pitch for any kind of service out there, but you need you need someone to guide you. You need training. You need people maybe to do it for you. Those will shorten the time span and lower the risk. Um, those you can pretty much know exactly what those costs are going to be. If you do it yourself, you don't know what your costs are going to be because you simply don't know how much you're putting at risk there. I think always finding trustworthy people to guide the way, help show you, help do it if you need that is the way to do it. Uh, and if you realize that you don't have the right brand or product to go and build on your own website and Amazon's working for you, stick with Amazon. <laughs> like don't, uh, don't give up what's working for you. I've seen too many people launch products on Amazon simply because We've been saying for a long time, I'm one of them says you can't have one product. You got to go out there and launch a lot of products. And it's true. You need more than one because if that one goes down, you need more. But if you take your eye off the ball on the one product that's making 80 percent of your revenue, just because someone told you you have to launch a product every month, that's not a good formula for success. So stick with what's wor working. Never take your eye off what's working and then dip your toes into these other areas that we're talking about. And then once you see some movement go a little bit deeper into it. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have time, like all of us being entrepreneurs don't, find people who've done it, who you trust, who aren't just standing in front of a Lamborghini and try to get their services, try to get their training, coaching, services tool, whatever it is. Uh, you will lower your risk uh, when you do that because it is it can be a very tough business. There's, you know, there's, there's risk involved in every business. This is no different. It's still the most amazing business out there because it, you can do it from your home. Uh, you got your office there. I got my home office here. I can't imagine ever going into a physical office again. And this type of brand building business affords me the luxury to do that. I want everyone to experience that. Uh, but you got, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it's easy anymore. There's money, time, risk involved in it. And being able to find people you trust to help you is invaluable and will help save you. It'll help you leapfrog, you know, years into the future. Yeah. Mike, well said. I, I really like that. I like the idea of like dipping your toe in the water, you know, and if you see something starting to hit, then go a little deeper. I think that is a, a fantastic approach to. You know, one other thing I want to mention too, Josh, is that in order to really build a brand and sell on your website, it's different. You know, it's different than just having a really good quality product you sell on Amazon, on, on some other side as well. 
the way the, the best advice to give to anyone who wants to sell on their website is only choose a product or only sell a product that you can visualize how to stop someone who's searching through Facebook to buy your product. If you don't have a product that can do that, then I wouldn't sell that product on our website. And if it's doing well on Amazon, keep selling on Amazon because you can continue optimizing ads and do that. But the best way right now to get traffic on your website is Facebook. Most people are scrolling through their feed on Facebook. And if you can't get their attention, then that's not the right product. Come back later when you have another product or focus on what's working for you already because it is a different mindset for advertising. It's interruption advertising, not, you know, people already looking for your product. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that approach as well is think about your product and whether it could actually stop somebody in, the, in their tracks. <laughs> um, fantastic. Well, Mike, as we wrap things up today, is there anything else on your mind that we haven't yet addressed that you think our audience needs to hear to help them scale their business to eight figures and beyond? Um, always watch your risk. Um, you know, don't ever think that this is an easy business. It's an amazing business. It's a life changing business. I can't imagine me not have made this leap in the past, but I knew what I could afford um, and I knew what I was willing to risk. I had good support from, you know, my family here uh, as well. And I had a high level of confidence would work, but not a hundred percent. So manage your risk, make sure that if you're doing this business, if you only have a few hundred bucks or a few thousand dollars, start slow. Don't go put money on a credit card to try this business. You need to limit your risk. And I know this sounds weird. Someone involved in selling e-commerce training and services. The first thing I'm telling them is limit your risk It's because I don't want anyone to get screwed over and like to ruin their life. Um, not that that's going to happen. If, if you are smart about this and limit your risk, go slow, do what you can do, then you have an unlimited upside in this business. Uh, and you can get free training out there. You can go out there and watch YouTube. Just try to make sure you know who to trust out there. You can get affordable training out there. There's companies like us out there. You can get great services out there from us, Josh, as well. Go for people you trust when you really want to build a business. And even if it's not us, just find someone you trust to guide the way. Don't do this blindly. Uh, and then like they they're the sky is the limit in this business. It still can happen. It's just not going to happen overnight. Anyone tells you that is lying to you and they're selling you something else. Yeah, I love that. Good words of wisdom, Mike. Now, as we wrap up the episode today, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. So, Mike, here are the three actionable takeaways I noted. Let me know if you think I'm missing anything here. All right. So number one, we talked about one of the biggest levers in order to help scale your business. If it's on Amazon right now to eight figures and beyond is optimizations and utilizing all of the tools that Amazon is giving to brand registered sellers. Right. Lean into the brand tailored promotions. Lean into anything new that Amazon is giving us that could be the premium A plus content. Maximize everything you can there. And one of the big ones is that the experiments, the A-B testing experiments that Amazon is doing for you. All you need to do is simply upload, you know, two different images and let Amazon run their analysis, right? They're going to pick the winner. They're incentivized to pick the winner because they want more revenue at the same time. So work with your partner, which is Amazon there, and always be testing. Don't just do this once a year. Action item number two, I'm going to argue should be Implement the conversion bomb. We went into a very, Mike elaborated in extensive detail how to set up that conversion bomb um, and how impactful it can be. Truly, like this is something that, as the name mentions, is going to increase your conversion rates and help blow up your sales in a good way. All right. So that's action item number two. And then last but not least, action item number three, I would say is going to be on the, the Amazon advertising front, which is going to be optimized for profitability, right? Make sure and have that mindset that assume all your sales are going to have to come from PPC in the near future because they might well do that. And make sure you're still profitable because if you're not, A, maybe you need to be increasing your prices. B, maybe those are more expensive keywords than you can advertise on. Um, and so go find those long tail keywords. But if you have that mindset, you're going to save money, but also be able to have money uh, to be able to reinvest into your business and then continue to grow that for the foreseeable future. So, Mike, is there anything else that you think I missed that you would recommend? I think you summarized it well. Those three, right? If people take away those three items and implement them when they're ready. 
uh, in their business, uh, only positive things could come out of it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, now it's time for you in the hot seat here with the three questions. Question number one is going to be, what has been the most influential book that you've read and why? Uh, for me, the most influential, influential of all time has been The Three Simple Steps by Trevor Blake. Um, I know for some people may think that he gets a little bit into the woo-woo stuff, we'll call it there, but the three steps that he teaches people um, has helped change my life and helped me be more successful. Uh, and I recommend anyone who really needs to focus on being positive, growing their business, having more confidence, getting out of all of the negativity in the world, read that book. It's been a life changer for me. That's awesome. That's one book I have never heard. So <laughs> I have now got that on my list. All right. Awesome. All right. Question number two here for you, Mike. What has been a new productivity tool or maybe software tool that you've recently discovered that you think is going to be a game changer? Well, it's not new. OK, so I'm it's kind of hard to say out here because I was going to say Google Keep. It's been around forever. For me, I use it all the time. Like I have it on my phone. I have it on my tablets. I have it on my computer. Um, anytime I have an idea or thought, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going in on this one. It's Google right. Keep. There's a dozen AI tools out there. There'll be a dozen more tomorrow. Google Keep is the place right now for me. And it can be Evernote. It can be something else. As long as you can use it on every device you're at, whenever you have a thought, an idea, a website, you see an ad come through on Facebook. I do this all the time on my phone. I see a great ad, usually for a new AI, AI tool. I will snap a photo and put it to my Google Keep because I want to come back to that later on. Um, to me, it is the place I'm putting all my ideas and action items at right now uh, so that I can be as productive as I possibly can. My phone's next to my bed. I don't know about you, Josh, but if I have an idea at night, uh, if I don't write it down or capture it, I'm going to be thinking about it all night long. And so it helps me sleep to pull up my phone, jot it into Google Keep, whatever you use, and then I can go to sleep because I know tomorrow I'm going to be able to review my notes on there and it's going to be there. Uh, so for me, it is Google Keep. It's pretty good. It does the job. It's multi-platform. It keeps me sane, helps me sleep. I love it. I love it. It sounds like you, you need a pitch. You need to be their sales ad. <laughs> I know. Where's the affiliate program yeah. for Google? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I think that is an exceptional idea. I think that too many people, they're like, oh, I'll make a mental note of that. Right. And then tomorrow morning you wake up and you're like, oh, crap. What was it that I had to remember? So I like that idea a lot. All right, Mike, last final question here. Who is somebody that you admire or respect the most in the e-commerce space that other people should be following and why? Yeah. So I got to give props to my business partner, Matt Clark. Uh, if you guys don't know him, uh, brilliant guy. I love how dedicated he is at everything, what he puts his mind to. But I can't give him too many props because he'll get a big head. So scratch that. We'll still leave it in. Um, great guy. Great guy to follow. I got to like, I, I feel bad saying this. I shouldn't say I feel bad. Alex Ramosi. Um, like I used to think that he was over the top when it came to marketing and the way his tactics, however, saw his last webinar, got his last book, uh, just wrapped it up a little bit ago today. It's brilliant when it comes to like building a business and just giving away your best stuff for free. I love that because I love teaching people. I love sharing strategies. I want them to see everyone be successful. He does that better than anyone I know, gives it all away. And that builds that reciprocity. People come back and still buy tens of thousands of books from him. His latest book um, is great because it, it does talk about that. Give people your free stuff, the best stuff you have. Don't hold anything back. And then when they ask to buy something for you, that's when you sell them something. Uh, I think it's brilliant. And uh, I'm going to follow him more. Uh, I've, I was always familiar with him. He's got a lot more respect. Me, I already had a lot of respect. Now it's even more with his latest strategy. And I think that's something that anyone looking to sell anything could get a lot of value of. Yeah, 100% echo that um, statement as well. Alex Hormozzi, follow his TikTok. That's uh, always dropping knowledge bombs there, which is awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. If people want to continue to follow you, learn more about what you do, even, uh, you know, hear from you more, where should people be following you? Um, well, I am on Instagram and uh, you can see me there. I don't post a lot out there. And when I do, it's usually a dad joke. Um, but every once in a while, I'll just go and share some kind of strategy out there too. So I'd follow me on Instagram. Uh, if they want to reach out to me, just go to amazing.com. That's our company site. Shoot an email to support amazing.com. They'll get it to me. I read all my emails. I respond to all of them. It may take me a little bit of time, 
uh, cause there's, there's quite a bit, but amazing.com is the best place to go out and find out about me, about all the free training we have, uh, our other programs out there as well. Uh, and I love hearing from people. So don't feel, feel bad about reaching out. Awesome. I love that. All right. Well, Mike, thank you again for your time. If people aren't following Mike, I encourage you to do so because Mike, you shared a ton of knowledge with us all today. So thanks again. Thanks, Josh. I love being here. Can't wait to do it again. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.